1610, Michelangelo Marisi da Caravaggio is on the run again. <laughs> no stranger to trouble, this artist's tangled with the law most of his life. But this time, it's different. This time, he's wanted for murder. There's a price on his head, alive or dead. So he does what he's always done, does what he does best. He tries to paint his way out of trouble. This is what he paints, David with the head of Goliath. It's a self-portrait. But why doesn't Caravaggio cast himself as the hero, David? Why does he paint himself as the villain of the piece, the monster, Goliath? Maybe he hopes that by making this guilty plea in paint, he can be spared. Perhaps by offering his head in a painting, he can save himself in real life. We like to think, don't we, that the genius is the hero, that the good guy wins. But this is Caravaggio, and the genius is the villain. Rome, 1600. The center of the greatest propaganda campaign Christendom has ever seen. The Catholic Church is under siege from the Protestants of Northern Europe who have a new message for those in need of salvation. Just depend on the word, said the Protestants, the gospel truth in black and white. A printed Bible is a Christian's guide. Paintings in churches are a distraction. Filthy idols, wipe them out. Catholics shot back. What about the millions who can't read? Don't they deserve to be saved? Shouldn't the poor have a vision of the sacrifice of the Saviour, the life of the Virgin? In the Catholic churches, War for Souls paintings were not art objects. They were the heavy artillery. So churches are repaired, others newly built, all lavishly decorated with paintings. The paintings responsible for defending the Catholic faith. But away from the Vatican, outside the gorgeously decorated high-walled palaces of the aristocratic cardinals, there was a very different Rome. The Rome of the sweaty, yelling crowd 100,000 of them jostling in the markets and the piazzas. The Rome of sour wine, old garlic, street urchins, shifty part-time soldiers who cut your purse or your throat just as soon as look at you. The Rome of beggars, buskers, tumblers, quacks and whores. Thousands of them 
working away in the Ortaccio, the evil Eden down by the river Tiber. This was Caravaggio's Rome. Cheap rooms and drunken nights with other perpetually broke painters. Living on their wits and shady credit, up for bother, always on the fly. Their motto as they prowled the streets, nec spe, nec metu, without hope, without fear. Shove this up your ass. Of course, he wasn't born a thug, just a boy from small town Lombardy, the small town of Caravaggio. His father looked after the house and the land of a local aristocrat. Respectable, not poor, not rich. But plague was the enemy of expectations, even small ones. And it killed off Caravaggio's father and his grandpa on the same day when he was just five. When he was 19, his mother died, so the children sold up and got out. He put in some time as an apprentice in Milan, but anyone who had real talent went to Rome. Caravaggio had arrived here in 1593 and had been promptly told what he was supposed to do if he was ever to become a great artist. First, draw old sculpture. Plenty of that lying around. Second, take yourself off to the old masters, Raphael perhaps. Be humbled, copy and learn. What you get at the end of it all was the point of art an idea of perfect form and ideal beauty. If you could make those celestial mysteries visible using your own brushes, then you'd be ready to convey that vision of perfection where it counted, in the war for souls. Oh yeah, Caravaggio didn't think so. Visions of paradise, who the hell knew about that? What he knew was right in front of his nose, down here on Earth, in the studio. The here and now, that would be the point of his art. Drawing? Who needed it? Caravaggio never drew a thing in his life. He just looked, eyeballed, and then he'd paint. When someone asked him what he was going to do for models, he pointed at the street. Them, he said, and he brought them into his studio. The rough awkwardness of Caravaggio's boy with a basket of fruit was a long way from the refined beauty of the Renaissance masters. From the start, he wasn't going to do things the way they were supposed to be done. Here's Caravaggio's response to the slavish copying of the classics, his painting of himself as Bacchus, the god of wine. Now, bear in mind, Bacchus isn't simply the god of binges. He's also the symbol of youth and beauty, the inspirer of poetry, song, and painting. And this is what Caravaggio does. Instead of eternal youth, he gives us something like the exact opposite, someone who's really sick. The flesh is greenish, the lips are gray, 
the eyes unslapped, the mouth curled into a leer. Instead of taking a human form and making it into a god, he takes a god and makes it all too human. The overdressed party animal as morning after wreck. And look at those grapes. Yes, he's got the bloom just right, but they're definitely past their sell-by date. And they're offered to us in an oily pour with filth-rimmed fingernails. No thanks. Now, northern Italian artists were famous for their technical skill, their naturalistic still lives. But Caravaggio gives us nature with a twist. Never mind art as beauty. He takes a basket of fruit and turns it into a life and death drama. He's pushing the envelope, challenging the very way that painting was supposed to be. It wasn't for the timid, but painting this sharp wasn't going to go unnoticed by those with an eye for quality. A cardinal, no less, Francesco Maria del Monte. No church mouse, our cardinal. He lives in an enormous pile of a palazzo surrounded by poets, musicians, and paintings. Del Monte of the roving eye is the biggest player on the art market. At the art dealers over the road, the Cardinal sees something that takes his fancy, card sharps. Del Monte takes in the brilliant color, the jokey action, the wink wink nudge nudginess of it all. Better still, he feels the presence of these people, the rosy-cheeked kid sucker, and the cool bravo about to take him down, as if they were right in front of him. <laughs> That's good. buys his painting for a song and then makes Caravaggio an offer he can't refuse. Why don't you move into the palazzo? Bed, bored, smartest company in Rome, poets, philosophers, terrific kitchen, my dear, never a dull moment. And the music. Well, you do like music, don't you? Caravaggio liked music, all right. And here he is, at the back of this tight little group, holding the cornet. Do we need Cupid on the left to let us know it's love songs that are their thing? Don't think so. The lead singer is crying his eyes out, and he's just tuning up. Now, there were lots of paintings of young boys with lutes and Baroque Rome, but never anything quite like this. Nothing this close up, nothing this fleshy and so close to us. It's like, oh yes, four youths in a closet. Excuse me, so sorry, don't mean to intrude. No, no, come on in, darling. Pull up a cushion, join us. We're just rehearsing. 